Hi and welcome to the SLR Digital Photography course. I'm Stephen Riley and I'll be your host and guide as we explore the amazing world of digital photography. This course is designed to give you the confidence to be able to shoot at a professional level. Whether you're shooting weddings, babies, portraits or landscapes. In this course we cover the fundamentals of digital photography including a hands-on approach of the different settings on your camera. We'll also give you the different tricks that professionals use to make sure they always have that perfect shot. So let's get started, shall we? Firstly, I'd like to outline what are the fundamentals that make up a great shot. You'll be able to follow through with me in the course as we explain how you can achieve each one of these fundamentals and in turn improve your photos dramatically. Note carefully, professional photographers always make a lot of mistakes, even the most celebrated photographers. You only get to see these amazing shots in their portfolio, but be sure there are loads of mistakes to get that perfect shot. If you aren't making mistakes, then you're not pushing yourself. So push yourself with your shots. It doesn't matter if it turns out bad, just delete it. A great shot is made up of 50% composition and 50% knowledge on how to use a camera, and on some occasions, a good stroke of luck. The following advice will help you improve your percentage of usable shots. Instead of getting two to three good ones out of 30 to 40 shots, you'll be looking at 50% or higher strike rate. Firstly, avoid camera shake. This is the single biggest problem in getting quality shots and it cannot be fixed afterwards in a photo editing program. Secondly, learn to compose your picture properly using rules like the rule of thirds and isolating the subject to make it clear. Even in a landscape scene, a good photographer draws our eye into a specific part of the photo. Also learn to introduce structure through your shots through using leading lines and depth of field. Learn to expose your picture properly. We'll teach you the tricks of the pros using exposure compensation and exposure bracketing to avoid under or overexposed photos. It's like a professional's ace in a poker match. You've got to learn to frame your picture properly. Would look better as a horizontal or vertical shot. Did I fill up the frame with the subject? You've got to get in close and fill up the frame. Also, check that unwanted items are not in the shot. Could it be improved by cropping? Try to shoot with a tripod or monopod where possible. You've got to learn to use focus lock and always use the highest resolution and highest quality settings. Remember, we don't pay to process our shots and buying an extra memory card won't break the bank. It seems like a lot of things to think about before you press the button, but these things will quickly become second nature to you. If you stick to these fundamentals, you'll be able to deliver great photos in a range of difficult situations. One of the best ways to avoid camera shake is with a good sturdy tripod. A professional almost always shoots with one. If you're shooting sports, a good choice to reduce camera shake is with a monopod. It's easy to pan on moving subjects and it's light and portable. A good tool for travellers is the Gorillapod. It's excellent for holding your camera in creative angles and moulds onto just about anything. I even use my Gorillapod for holding my off-camera flash. Next tip is to try to remove yourself away from the camera with a shutter release. It's a simple, affordable solution. The release attaches onto the side of your camera. You can upgrade to a shutter release and timer combined. And you can use this for time-lapse photography. They are a little bit more expensive. The only problem with this is that you're still connected to the camera, so there is a chance of camera shake. So instead, you can use a remote control. You are completely removed from the camera, which guarantees a steady shot. If all else fails, you can use a timer on the back of your camera. You just set it, step backwards, and the shot is taken without camera shake. Another way to reduce camera shake is with one of these, a simple bean bag. You place it on the surface, you get your camera and you mould it through into the beans and you can get some great angles here and it's there, rock solid. So there you go, look at the angles you can get here from this. And there you go, it's moulded in and it's very solid. Another simple way to look at reducing camera shake is to actually look at the way that you're taking the photograph. A lot of people get a really good shot and then as they're about to take the photo, they sort of jab away really hard and that causes camera shake as you're pushing through like this. A simple way to reduce that 
is to control your breathing. So you breathe in deeply as it's about to take the photo, and then you exhale slowly and squeeze the trigger. There you go. So you breathe in, focus, slowly exhale, and press the button. So there you go. If camera shake causes 90% of our problems in our images, there are a number of great ways there to avoid it. Holding your camera properly is one of the easiest ways to reduce camera shake and many people seem to get it wrong. It's just quite simple. You get your strap, wrap it around twice like this, which gives you a grip through here. Place a hand here. Make yourself almost like a human tripod where you've got one section here, another section of the tripod here. Bring your arms in, place your hand underneath your lens, breathe in. As you're exhaling, take the shot. So the best long exposures I've done at night have been handheld without a tripod. You get to a really nice scene, you're there with your camera, you don't have a tripod, so what do you do? I'll show you this quick, easy method where you can get five to 10 second exposures at night without a tripod. First of all, you've got to find yourself something to lean or push against. For example, this tree. You get through, push yourself across, get yourself in position, and there you go. You can do a five second exposure, handheld straight away there. Find yourself something solid, get a few points of contact in, and there we go. Easy five second exposure handheld. Not all that much really to get hold of, it's just a tree here. So you get your body through and your lens, lock it in, five second exposure handheld. No tripod, no problem at all. A good general rule to avoid camera shake is to shoot at a speed higher than your camera lens. For example, this lens here is a 50mm lens. This means you'll need to shoot at a speed above 1 50th of a second to avoid camera shake. The longer the lens, the more it magnifies camera shake. Here with this 30mm lens, I could get away with shooting above 1 30th of a second. But if I move here to this 100mm lens, I'll need to increase the speed to over 100th of a second. So remember, always shoot above the speed of the lens that you're shooting with. With cameras just getting better and better, one of the biggest differences between a normal photo and a work of art is your composition. One of the first rules to learn is the rule of thirds. This dates back thousands of years and is sometimes referred to as the golden section. In your viewfinder, draw two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. Most cameras have this grid inbuilt into their camera and you only need to switch it on. Firstly look at your horizontal lines. Having your horizon in the middle of the shot looks boring, but placing it a third up or a third down is preferred and improves your composition dramatically. Then look at your verticals. Instead of having the subject in the middle of the frame, try moving the subject to the left third or to the right third. This is the basis of the rule of thirds. The trick is to place your subject along the intersection of the lines. Most beginners start by placing the subject smack bang in the middle of the frame. Try to start using the rule of thirds and you'll see your photos are instantly much better. One of the keys to using this method is to use exposure lock. You aim at the subject and lock down the focus and then recompose according to the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds helps you emphasize specific parts of your photo. For example, if you'd like to emphasize the ocean, you'd bring the horizon up to the top third of the frame. If you'd like to emphasize the sky, you bring the horizon to the bottom third of the frame. So switch on your grid and start to use the horizontals and verticals to improve your composition using the rule of thirds. <music> 
Leading lines are a simple but dramatic way to make a difference in the composition of your images. You can use them to create a depth of field and lead the viewer to focus in on a subject. Leading lines can be found everywhere, man-made and in nature, so always keep a lookout for them. Take a look at this example here. So here we are set up on the wharf. We've got a really nice shot here. And we're gonna to start to show you how to use leading lines. So let's move back a bit and get a shot without leading lines. One of the best tools you can use is actually your feet. So if you step back, change your angle of your camera through a little bit and start to pick up the lines which direct our eye directly through to the model and looks really good that way. Getting the right exposure is not as hard as it seems as long as you tell the camera which part of the scene you want exposed. Modern day metering gets it right about 90% of the time, but here are some modes that will help you get it right every time. You'll find that most cameras have three to four different metering modes, evaluative or multi-metering, partial metering, spot metering, and center weighted metering. We'll focus on the three main modes. Matrix metering. The camera takes into account the whole scene in front of it and then adjusts the exposure accordingly so everything is exposed on average. This mode is useful for general scenes but cannot expose properly in tricky lighting situations. Spot metering. This metering method measures a middle 1% of the scene. It's extremely accurate on that section and disregards the rest of the image. This method is used mainly in scenes where there is a big contrast and the most important part is in the center of the frame. For example, a backlit scene. Center weighted metering. This metering method concentrates on the middle 70% of the shot and the outside of the frame is less significant. In summary, if you'd like the whole scene metered, then choose matrix metering. If the center of the image is more important to you, then you would choose center weighted metering. If nothing else matters in the shot, just the subject in the center, you can safely use spot metering. This is a classic scene to uh, use spot metering. You've got a backlit scene here where you can almost hardly see the subject because the sun's so bright. And you take a few shots in matrix metering and all you end up with is a silhouette because the camera's trying to take a photo for the whole scene in front of you. You can try center weighted, but it still won't do much good. So the only real way you can do this is by using your spot metering and go up close to the subject and aim your spot metering right on the center of the face and you'll see that the camera will just meter for the face blows the background out a little bit but you'll get a really good picture of the subject in front of you in certain lighting conditions your camera can get confused and give you the wrong exposure this is where the exposure compensation comes in handy you can use it to increase or decrease your exposure by one full stop to achieve a properly exposed photo. Here's an example of it in action. When you've got a brightly lit scene outside and the inside has got a different exposure level, you can start to use your exposure compensation. So to do this, is we take a shot through here, we see the outside's brightly lit, but we can't really make out the features of the model's face. So we start to just bring up our exposure compensation there. I've moved up half a stop here and we start to see the features of the face starting to come out. And so we move through again, another full stop. Start to see the back blowing out, but the model's face coming brightly lit. So I'll just push it a little bit more. And you see there that we're really starting to blow it out through our exposure compensation. So we'll just move it back a little bit. There we go. All the features are coming through the model. So you can use this to bring up the level of the subject through our exposure compensation. So remember, 
When your subject is overexposed or underexposed, you can simply use exposure compensation for a great shot. This is a common scene with photographers and a very common problem. You have a scene in front of you that is very hard to expose for. The camera is torn between exposing for the bright sunny day outside and exposing for the darker interior. There is an explanation. We are born this super camera in our head. It's better than any Sony, Canon or Nikon. Our eyes see about 24 stops of light, but unfortunately our cameras see only about 14 stops of light. So you have a problem. How can we increase the range of our camera to see the same scene as we do and get the right exposure? This brings us on to one of the tricks of professionals, exposure bracketing. You dial in how many stops you want to bracket and the camera under or overexposes to those levels. In this example, I've taken a few different photos to show you the range you can obtain. I chose one of the shots that looked the best and adjusted the lighting slightly in Photoshop. If I had really wanted to, I could have used a process called HDR and I could have joined two exposures together. Luckily my exposure was good enough to use. You can use exposure bracketing at any time and it's insurance for those times you don't get a second chance to get the right exposure. Getting the right exposure is up to you and what you want to be doing with your exposures creatively. Here I'm going to be shooting a couple of different exposures using a wide aperture and a small aperture. When you use a wide aperture and you have it completely open, your depth of field is almost razor thin. Just behind her starts to blur out. So we'll take a shot here and we start to blur out the background. But as we start to change it through, and I'll move it up to around about f4, you see the background start to come into focus. So I'll move it up a little bit more here. So we got f8, and you can start to see the trees and the scene behind the model starting to come into focus. So I'll just move through a little bit higher again. So there we are, F11, and you can start to see the trees really coming to focus here. And we'll move all the way down to F16. Now it's F16 and 120 for the second, so we'll probably get a bit of movement in this shot. So if you're seeing that shot, everything's in focus at F16, but at F1.4, the model's in focus, but the background's completely out of focus. Taking photos on a bright sunny day is not the ideal situation, but it's a common event for most of us. So let's look at some ways that we can combat this bright sun. I'm using today one of these. It's a 5-in-1 reflector. They range from around $30 up to $150, but after you see its uses today, you'll find they're invaluable. These are great, these reflectors. They're cheap as opposed to a flash or anything like that. There's nothing in them to break. There's no mechanical faults or anything like that. It's just a simple reflector. You don't need to color correct after you've been using a reflector as well because you're reflecting the ambient light in the photo where usually you need to use gels to color correct flashes. There are a couple of disadvantages as well though. Unfortunately, you're either gonna need an assistant to hold the reflector or you need one of these. This is a special clamp which holds the reflector for you. The only problem with these is when it gets a bit windy they tend to sort of knock over unless you've got a few sandbags on them. But besides that, this is a great investment. 
I'm starting out here with using the diffuser part of the reflector kit to diffuse the sun. You need to get that diffuser between the sun and your subject. What you are doing is modifying the light from a small harsh light to a big diffuse light. It fills the subject with a nice even light. Next we used a gold reflector. The gold reflector added a warm feel to the model. We changed the angles of the reflector to fill in the shadows. You can vary the intensity of the fill by moving it further away from the subject. It really gives you that afternoon sunset feel. As you change to the silver, you increase your highlights and the contrast of the shot. Here we use the white reflector. The white reflector is a great way to fill in the shadows in the face and it doesn't have that high contrast the silver reflector gives you. Sometimes changing a reflector is like an IQ test and I have failed badly. Thank God I've got my assistance. One of the most underused things on a camera during daylight is your flash. Most people use your flash at night, but the best time to use it is actually during the day as you use it as fill-in flash to take out the shadows out of the face. So let's take a few shots here using our fill-in flash. You can also vary the intensity of your fill-in flash by using your flash exposure compensation. So you can raise it up or lower the flashing compensation to reduce or increase the amount of flash on the face. Most people think when you're shooting outside that you've got to shoot with your back to the sun. The problem with that is you've got your model or your subject staring directly up towards the sun and squinting and the shots invariably come out bad. The best way to do it is actually reverse that and have your model with the sun behind her and you shooting through. And as you do that, you'll see that you start to get these really nice highlights coming through the hair. And you could use your flash to start to illuminate and take the shadows out of the face as well. And that's the best way to do it. You put the model, the back to the sun, you come through, and you fill in the shadows and you get that really nice look. Look at that, that's a great shot. Excellent. Another tip when you're shooting outdoors is to always use one of these, a lens hood. They dramatically reduce lens flare, which is a real nightmare when you're shooting outside. An alternative to shooting out in the bright sun is to simply move into the shade. We've moved under the shade of this tree and as you look in the shade you'll find that there's a, a sweet spot in the shade. As we move around, so we ask the subject to move around, we start to move around here and then you look at the face and you see there it is. There's the perfect angle where the face is correctly illuminated in the shade. So next time you're shooting the shade make sure you look out for that sweet spot. One common mistake an amateur makes is that when it's cloudy, they tend to put the camera away and wait for a bright sunny day. It's very difficult to achieve good shots shooting portraits in bright sunlight. The sun is a harsh light, that brings out many shadows and isn't usually kind to faces. In a portrait studio, the lights they use are very soft, diffused lights. A cloudy day is perfect for portraits. The clouds form a natural diffuser and give you a beautiful, soft light for portraits.
Framing a picture properly is what makes a difference between a good shot and a great shot. One of the best pieces of equipment you can use here is often the cheapest as well, your legs. A great shot usually means you have to take a different angle, up high or low, and move around to get a new perspective. Try this simple experiment at home or in the park. Grab your camera and a friend and start to shoot using different angles and different objects in the environment to frame the subject. Make sure you're really getting close and fill the frame as well. You will see that these simple, easy changes will produce a much more professional looking shot for a minimal amount of effort. Making sure your photo is clear of unwanted objects is a must. There are two ways to do it, either when you are taking the shot or doing it in post-production in a program like Photoshop. If you're like me and prefer to be out there shooting instead of spending loads of time locked up to your computer fixing your mistakes, then start to be aware of this and minimize this at the time of shooting. Otherwise, cropping and removing these things will take forever. A good photographer always looks to see if their photos can be improved by cropping. Some professionals quote that up to 70% of their photos are cropped. Sometimes you can find a good picture inside a picture. Always try to look if you can improve your photo by cropping. You can also start to crop to use better composition rules, for example, the rule of thirds. Have a look in this example. The original photo was good, but by cropping closer and using the rule of thirds, the composition looks better and you can really focus in on the expression of the surfer. Another important process to improve your photos is to make sure your horizontals and verticals are straight. Nothing looks worse than a great shot spoiled by a bad angle. Sometimes it's tough at the time of shooting to get the picture perfect. You could be shooting at night or not have enough time to set up the shot properly. Always be aware of this and crop afterwards to get this right. Have you ever wondered how the professionals always seem to get that exact moment for a perfect photo? Well there's actually a trick to this and it's very simple. It's called continuous shooting. Every modern SLR camera has this and it's called either continuous shooting or burst mode. It usually ranges from 3 shots per second up to around 10 shots per second. Open your camera's menu and select this mode for shooting difficult subjects including children and sports shots. Shoot off around the shots and then go back through them to pick out the best images. This is a child photographer's secret weapon in getting everyone smiling in the photo. Focus lock is a simple yet powerful way to compose your photo. You've got a subject smack bang into the middle of the frame, but you want to move across to use composition rules like the rule of thirds. So what do you do? You come through here, focus in on the subject, then once you've got your subject focused properly, hold your focus here locked, you move across to so start to use proper composition rules. It's a simple yet effective way to use your camera. So let's do a recap of what we've learned so far. Camera shake. We've learned the different ways to reduce camera shake and achieve those really crisp, sharp photos. You need to be able to hold your camera properly and a better solution is to remove yourself from the camera using tripods and remote controls. We've learned to compose your picture properly. We've gone through composition rules like using the rule of thirds. We've learned to use leading lines to create a sense of depth in your photo. We've learned to expose your picture properly. We've learned the tricks of the pros, including exposure bracketing, exposure compensation, metering modes, filling flash and reflectors. 
We've learned to frame your picture properly. We've also learned how to use objects around the subject as a natural frame. Cropping unwanted items. We've learned to look out for unwanted items, but also ways to improve our photo in post-production. These are the fundamentals of a great shot. If you abide by these rules before taking a photo, you will see a massive improvement in your photography straight away. So let's start to explore our camera. If we know how the system works, then we can really push it. Camera modes are like your gears in a car. You wouldn't know how to drive if you didn't know how to shift gears. So let's look at what each different mode does and how we can use it. Your first mode is your full auto or point and shoot. After that, you've got your program mode. After that, you've got your AV mode, which stands for aperture value. Then you have your TV mode, which stands for time value. Then you have your manual mode, which is full manual. And last but not least is your B mode, which stands for bold mode. Let's start to investigate and see how we can use each one of these modes. First mode is your point and shoot or your full auto. It sounds great. You point your camera through and the camera takes control of everything. Unfortunately, you have no creative control at all. If you're in badly lit scenes or backlit scenes, there's a lot of inaccuracies with the camera. And the only things really you have control over is your resolution and your flash modes. So let's move on to the other modes and find out how we can use them. Program mode. It's like a smart version of auto mode. You've got control over white balance, shutter speed, flash control, and a few other things. But besides that, the camera controls everything. It's just for those people who just want to dip their feet into the water after coming out of the auto mode. The next mode we have is your AV mode. It's a very important mode to know about because 99.9% .9 of photographers are in this mode. You dial in the depth of field you want and the camera handles the rest. When, I, when I'm talking about depth of field, I'm talking about if you've got a shallow depth of field, your subject's in focus here and everything behind them is out of focus. That's something like an f2.8. But if you have a wide depth of field, for example a landscape shot, everything's in focus and that's something like an F22. So you dial in your F22, the camera controls the rest, and it's a really great mode to know about. Our next mode is our TV mode, or S on some cameras. The TV stands for time value. And now that time value is the length of time that your shutter is open. This controls your motion in your shots. It's a must for sports photographers who want to dial in something like 1,000th of a second and really freeze frame the action. Or you could be a nature photographer and be shooting a stream and you'll lower it to something like one tenth of a second and you shoot the stream and you get that nice flowing of the water and, and the frothing up of the water as well. So your TV controls the motion in your shots. Manual mode. Manual mode is the most creative mode the camera has. You pretty much control everything in the camera. It gives you recommendations of what you should use, but it doesn't use them. You really need to know about shutter speed, aperture and ISO before you attempt to use this mode. And last but not least is our B mode, which stands for bulb. The name derives from in the old days, the photographers used to have to sit there with a bulb holding the shutter open. We use our bulb mode for getting long exposure shots, for example, a nighttime shot, three or four minutes. So there you have it, camera modes. The three that I really want you to start to concentrate on is your manual mode, your TV mode, and your AV mode. If you learn how to use these three modes, you can shoot any situation. Now that we know about the program modes in our camera, it's time to learn about the actual part that collects our photographs, the sensor. In SLR photography, there are two types of sensors, full frame and small frame. An example of a full frame camera is the 5D or the 1D. The sensor takes the same size photo as a 35mm camera. A small frame camera has what it's called a crop factor and crops your photos, usually by about 1.6. This can be a Canon 7D or a 550D. The advantages of a full frame camera 
is they're great for landscape photos as you see exactly what you're shooting. They also have a better depth of field for portraits. As the sensor is larger, they require less light to expose the photo and are superior in lower light. The small frame has a crop factor of 1.6 and it actually magnifies your shots. So when you're shooting with a 50mm lens, it will be the same as an 80mm lens. Small frame cameras are perfect for sports as this magnification turns a 200mm lens into a 320mm lens. Cameras tend to shoot more quality images close to the center of the photo, so even though the photo is cropped, it's still taking the best part of the photo. So the choice is yours, full frame or small frame, large frame for landscapes and small frame for anything that needs to be magnified, for example sport or wildlife photography. ISO is basically a measure of the sensitivity of the camera's sensor. If you increase the ISO, you are amplifying the sensor and in turn increasing its ability to shoot in low light situations. The catch is, as you are amplifying the sensor, you are opening the door to a photographer's worst enemy, digital noise. It appears as a grainy pattern scattered across the photo and it's almost impossible to remove in post. Best uses for a high ISO are when you're shooting in low light conditions, when you're shooting sports where you want to increase the shutter speed, or anywhere that it's not permitted to use a flash, so you have to use the ambient lighting. Remember, always shoot on the lowest ISO that is possible to achieve the lowest noise in your image. This will improve your chances of getting the best photo. The technology behind digital cameras is complex but there are a few easy things to learn that will help your shooting immensely. First of all is a pixel. A pixel is a coloured square and there are millions of these in each photo. If you enlarge a photo you will see the individual pixels. Try it. This is called pixelated. When you see all the pixels together and from a distance they form a nice picture. When you take a photo the sensor converts that light into pixels, each one representing a certain colour. The more pixels you have in an image, the sharper it will reproduce. This refers back to one of the fundamental rules of photography. Always try to shoot on the best quality you can. Remember, we can always buy an extra memory card, but we cannot increase the resolution of a bad photo. Resolution is a thing that confuses many photographers, but it's actually quite simple. Image resolution refers to the number of pixels that are used to make a photo. That's it simple. The higher resolution, the better the photos will look and the larger the pictures will be. On the downside, you get bigger image files so it takes a lot of storage space and it takes a long time to download and it will make a web page very slow to download. Image resolution is stated as pixel dimension, meaning number of pixels wide by its height, or sometimes it's just stated as 12 megapixels. For example, an image that's 2048 pixels in width times 1,536 pixels in height has a total of 3,145,728 or 3.1 megapixels. So basically, next time people are talking megapixels, you know exactly what it is. It's the height of the pixels times the size of the width. So let's learn about shutter speed. I'm going to get my friend Jake here to do a bit of skateboarding for us and we'll take a couple of different shots of him. First of all, we're going to take a shot around about 1 500th of a second to freeze the action. Then we're going to do another shot where we get some motion in the shot. So we'll get Jake going past and we'll shoot around 1 30th of a second and we'll pan with the subject. So the subject will be frozen solid but the background will be moving and then we're going to get a shot him coming through where we shoot stationary here at 1 30th of a second so he'll be moving but the background will be stationary so let's get into it Jake so I'm shooting here on the TV mode so let's start off with 1 500th of a second and we'll freeze him solid so I've got 1 500th of a second all right Jake let's go okay great okay excellent that looks really good Okay, for this next shot, I'm dialing 130 for the second and I'm going to pan with the subject 
so we'll get the subject looking reasonably stationary and the background blurred to invoke motion in the background. Let's go, Jay! Okay, excellent. Okay, for the next shot, I'm going to dial in 1 30th of a second, but I'm going to keep the camera stationary. So what we'll get from that is we'll get the subject moving but the background stationary. Okay, for this next one, I'm going to really push the envelope and I'm going to do it 1 20th of a second. So let's see how this one comes up. All right, Jake, let's go. Oh, that's looking great. So there we go. Three easy methods to learn and you get great results. Did you learn anything today, Jake? Once you have that perfect photo, then you need to store it. There are three main formats, JPEG, RAW and TIFF files. Each one has its advantages and disadvantages. JPEG is the most common format people use. One of the biggest advantages is that it compresses image data so you end up with a much smaller image file. It opens in PC and Mac and it's instantly ready to use. The disadvantages are that JPEGs lose data each time they're saved and the range of changes you can make in post is quite limited. Most professionals shoot in RAW. It's basically an unprocessed image, leaving you to process the image later in post. Advantages are, RAW files have a much higher dynamic range than JPEGs and can be manipulated more easily and the quality is much higher. Disadvantages are you need to process them before you can use them. The files are huge and many programs can't even open them. My advice is to shoot in both RAW and JPEG. You can have the best of both worlds. TIFF files are popular because they preserve 100% of the data when saved. Its disadvantage is that the files are huge. TIFF is usually used to enlarge and print photos. In summary, it's really a question of time. If you want an image ready, then go and shoot in JPEG. If you have the time to process the image, then shoot in RAW. White balance can make a huge difference in the look and feel of your photographs. If you shoot in RAW, you can pick the white balance you prefer during processing. If you shoot in JPEG, you have to make the decision in camera. The world of digital has made a lot of things easy and white balance is one of them. With film, the only way to change the white balance was with filters over the frontal lens. With digital, it's a lot easier. The light that is produced in digital photos is made up of three colours, red, green and blue. Any colour can be reproduced by mixing parts of these colours. The colours are only recorded properly when the three wave bands are in correct balance. Our brain automatically adjusts these colours in fluorescence, incandescent and halogen lighting. Most people are not aware of the changes compared to normal daylight. The sensors will pick up on this and unless the correction is not made, the result will be unnatural colours. The white balance control makes these corrections. The white balance is the amount of blue light to red light emitted by any light source. Green light is ignored as it is in the middle of the spectrum. This is why when we adjust the white balance, we either add red or blue to the photo. Light is measured in degrees Kelvin. The higher the degrees Kelvin, the bluer the colour. The lower degrees Kelvin, the redder it is. A good way to remember this is to think of a flame. A normal flame is red, but as it gets hotter, it goes towards a hot blue flame. These temperatures move from cold, almost a blue colour, to warm, a reddish colour. We correct the white balance by adding the opposite colour to it. If the photo is too warm, too much red in it, then the photo is cooled down by adding blue. If the photo is too blue, too cold, then we add red to it. Auto white balance will generally fix most lighting in the middle range, but once outside this range, you will need to add custom settings. One of the hardest things to understand in photography is that our brain has our own white balance, so whatever light source we see, it automatically adjusts. Photographers should always check their white balance at the beginning of each photo shoot. LCD screens are good for large differences, but because of the resolution is very low, it's difficult to fine tune the white balance. 
If the white balance is not too far out, an image editing program can correct the imbalance. Shooting in RAW mode will not add any white balance to your photo, and it can be added later with the image editing program. You can adjust the white balance in a number of different ways. You can use Auto White Balance, which sets a white balance for you. You can dial it in from the presets, sunny, cloudy, etc. You can input an actual number in degrees Kelvin, or you can add a custom white balance by setting the white balance with a card. The presets are usually very accurate and worth to get the right colors. You can also use these presets to add different colors to your shots. You can warm your photo by adding some red tones to a normal scene or cooling another scene by adding blue to it. Setting your own white balance is relatively simple as long as you have the proper card. Many people try to set their white balance using sheets of paper that are not a true white and not getting a true white balance. There is a debate between using a grey card or white card. You can use either. The camera just needs an average value and either will give you that. Some people favor the grey card as the white card can be blown out in the sunlit situations. The white card works better in low light situations. The most important thing is that it's a true white or a true 18% grey. Even if you're shooting raw photos, it's good to take a white balance so you can use this later in post-production. You can just use your eyedropper and Photoshop will correct all the photos for you using your white balance. Let's look at how you can do a custom white balance. It's very easy, but the first thing you're going to need is one of these. A true grey or a true white card. You can buy them from your local retailer. They, they're anything from $10 up to $30 and it really is worth having one of these. So first thing you do is you move your grey card in front of the camera, fill out the frame, take a shot. Every manufacturer is different. With Canon, you just come through here, move down to custom white balance, you use your photo, so you do set. It took me 10 seconds or less and I've got a custom white balance. Now once we've got the custom white balance in there, let's take a shot on auto white balance. Now the white balance at the moment, under these lights, these lights are rated at 5,500 Kelvin. They're photographic lights, so it's a pretty easy thing to meter. So we'll just shoot through, get a shot here. So there's our auto white balance. Now let's start to run through the other settings and see the changes it makes to the shots. So first one I'm moving to is sunny. Now sunny is rated at 5,200. Not very much different from 5,500. So we'll take a shot and we won't, we shouldn't see much difference through our shot here. There we go. Now, as we move along, next one we move to is shade. Now shade is rated at 7,000 Kelvin. Because the camera thinks it's a lot hotter, in essence a lot bluer, so then it adds red to your photos. This is an old trick that landscape photographers and also portrait photographers use to warm up the photo. If you're shooting in the morning or in the evening, you want to get those really nice red tones through your photo, just move on to shade and you'll see it really warm up the photo. So we'll move along now to cloudy. Cloudy is rated about 6,000, which in essence does warm up your photo as well. We're shooting at 5,500. Because it's 6,000, it's above, it's going to think it's hotter, so it still adds some red into it. So you can use your cloudy to warm up your photos as well. So next one we're going to do is have a look at tungsten. Now tungsten light is a normal everyday light that you have in your house. It's rated about 3,200. Because it thinks it's a lot cooler and being a lot more red, it's going to add blue to your photo to counteract the red. Next one we've got is fluorescent. Fluorescent's rated around 4,000 Kelvin, which is below. So it's going to think it's quite red, so it'll still add blue, not as much as the one before as the tungsten but it'll still be quite blue. Now flash is rated around 5,500 anyway, so it's gonna be pretty much the same as the others. So let's just take a shot out of interest. It looks a little bit redder there, so it may be rated a little bit above 5,500. Now we've moved on to our custom white balance. This is the original white balance we've done with our gray card, so this should be perfect, spot on. So let's take a shot there. Okay, excellent. Now we'll move on to our Kelvin. Now with the Kelvin, you can dial in the Kelvin level you let yourself. I'm going to start first of all on 5500, which is what these lights are rated at. So we'll move up to 5500. 
So that's a shot around 5,500. We'll have a look at that and see how it goes. Now I'm going to move the Kelvin to the highest level we can, around about 10,000. Now because it's so high, the camera will think it's a really, really sort of hot shot, really blue. So it's kind of going to add a lot of red to the photo. Now I'm going to move the Kelvin down to the lowest level we can. So we'll just move that through. At 2500, the camera thinks it's really warm meaning red, so it starts to add a lot of blue to it to try and counteract that red to get it to your white level. So there you have it. There's many different ways you can change your white balance easily on your camera. So now it's time for you to be the star. It's time for you to get out there and put your newfound knowledge into practice. So grab your camera and get out there and start shooting. First choose a mode that you're comfortable with. Perhaps start with a simple approach using the AV mode. Choose AV if you want to control the depth of the field, if you're shooting portraits or landscapes. You set the depth of the field through your f-stops and the camera will do the rest. Or you could choose TV mode if you want to control the speed of the shots. For example sports, if you want to freeze the action you dial in the shutter speed and the camera does the rest. You can use manual if you would like, but I would suggest to get more familiar with the AV and TV modes, as most photographers never take their camera off these modes. If you're really timid and want to dip your toes in, then start with the program mode. It's a cut above point and shoot. You can also start to dial in some settings as well. You can dial in your ISO, but remember, always shoot on the lowest ISO to reduce noise on your photo. You can set your own white balance and choose the format you would like to shoot on. So get out there and start shooting and use these tips and review your shots constantly as well, which will fast track your learning curve dramatically. So good luck. Cheers.